from Hollywood, the Hollywood Radio Theater. Starring Tyrone Power and Linda Christian in The Mississippi Gambler. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. One of the most colorful eras of American history took place along the mighty Mississippi. It was a period of gorgeously gowned ladies, escorted by impeccable gentlemen, whose code of manners was determined, whether dancing at fancy balls or gambling on the riverboats. Tonight we recreate this era for you in Universal International's highly dramatic love story, The Mississippi Gambler. And as our stars, we have chosen a perfect romantic team, Tyrone Power and Linda Christian, in their first appearance together on radio. Now act one of The Mississippi Gambler, starring Tyrone Power as Mark Fallon and Linda Christian as Angelique Duro. <laughs> I first met Mark Fallon in the spring of 1853. I was on the dock in St. Louis waiting just for the likes of him, a green young stranger begging to have his bankroll license. I wandered over to the freight shed, took out a deck of cards, and started laying them down in a barrel. You're sure having a time with those cards, mister. I've been watching you. You have? I uh, hope you don't mind. Oh, don't mind at all, son. All I'm doing is making a fool out of myself. You see these three cards? Well, sir, there was this traveling man last night. He just laid these three cards down on the table and bet me $20. I couldn't tell him which one was the queen. You sure he was a traveling man? Oh, no doubt about that, son. He even had his sample cases with him. Well, sir, I swore I knew where the queen was every time. By Jingo, and I bet my $20. You lost. Well, anyway, give me the cards to practice with them. You know, you might end up a gambler. Going to try it on the folks back home till I get my money back. Uh, maybe get my money back right now. Me? These three cards. Now, was you a betting man, son? I got $20. Here says you can't find that queen. Done. All right. Which one's the queen? You sure you want me to tell you? Well, son, you just bet me $20. In that case, the queen's in your left hand, just where you palmed it. <clears throat> Looks like I made a terrible mistake. Professional, huh? No. No, but I'm going to be. And congratulations. I never saw anyone switch cards that perfectly. You're know, the first one who hasn't complained about it. Uh, what's your name? Mark Fallon. Me? I'm Kansas John Polly. Never heard of me? Well, I'm new in these parts, Mr. Polly. I'm from New York. Active in gambling there? Well, in a way... There was always a game going on in my father's fencing academy ever since I can remember. I finally got tall enough to sit in between fencing lessons. You're a decent-looking young fella, son. Now, why would you want to get mixed up in a crooked life like this? I got different ideas about gambling, Mr. Polly. I'm going to deal honest cards. Well, that sure will be a novelty on the river. I hope you're good, son. You'll be up against some mighty dirty competition. How much of a stake do you have? Six hundred dollars. Well, you can lose that in half an hour on these riverboats. Mm, but I don't intend to lose. Now, if you don't mind, I think I'll get aboard. He walked down to the gangplank. Just as he reached it, a carriage came flying down the dock. In it, a young man and a girl. For a moment, it looked like those horses were running away. Oh, now, boy. Easy now. Oh, up there. Oh. You. Oh. Get away from those horses. Well, I was afraid you'd tip over, miss. High-strung horses need a firm hand. I've handled high-strung horses for quite a few years. And when the time comes that I need help, I'll... Oh, oh, oh. Easy now. Easy. Oh, boy. Oh. Oh. Oh, there now. Thank you, sir. That whistle frightened them. Oh, whistles will do that to horses. To beautiful women, too, sometimes. You're an expert on both, I suppose. Well, I'm interested in both. Just a moment. My sister doesn't care to discuss your interest. So it seems. Better go aboard, Angelique. I'll find a boy to drive these horses back to Fletcher. Quality, folks, son. Real quality. Oh, my. You know them? But did I take that little pepper pot over my knee and whale her. 
$20 to 10, she looks back at me, Polly. Well, here's where I get my money back. She'd no more look back at you than she... Looks like I owe you a total of $30. Oh, you'll do fine on the Mississippi, son. You'll do just fine. That night, I watched Mark at the card table. He dealt it on his deck. What was more remarkable, he won. He won from professionals, and he won from gentlemen. He didn't make any friends that night, but he sure made a pile of money. Among the heavy losers was the young man in the carriage. After the game broke up, he came looking for Mark. I hope you didn't mind waiting for me, Mr. Fallon. Not at all. How much do I owe you? $4,100. A little more than cover it. A necklace, Mr. Duro? It was appraised for more than $7,000. Those are diamonds. But this is a family heirloom. Your sister It's no concern of yours what it is. Does it satisfy the debt? Yes. Thank you. Good night, Mr. Fallon. We'd both been winners that night. And the next day, our immediate future looked mighty rosy. Over $3,000 in cash, Polly. And it's all honest money. <laughs> Looks like we're doomed to stay at the best hotel in New Orleans. If we keep lucky. How long do you stop over there, Polly? Uh, two weeks, then I'm broke again. How's that? Pharaoh. Can't help playing that game, even though I know it's crooked. Terrible having such a vice at my age. Are you a Pharaoh player, son? I said, are you a... Oh. I'll be back in a moment, Polly. Miss Duro. Well, what is it? What do you want? I believe your brother made a mistake last night. This necklace, this is yours, isn't it? Yes. I wanted to return it to you. How do you mean, a mistake? Well, I won from him at cards. He'd been drinking a bitter. I don't think he'd have chosen this. My brother doesn't take my property without my permission. Oh, I'm sure of that. It's very beautiful. You must value it highly. I've just one thing to say to you. I don't speak to strangers, nor do I ex accept charity from gamblers. Good afternoon. Good morning, my sweet sister. Laura, how could you dare steal my necklace? Your necklace? I... You gave it to that gambler. He showed it to me. Oh. I'm sorry, Leah, but I, I had to. Why? Well, because I'm a fool. Sitting down with those card shots, they took all my cash and 4000 besides. And you take the one thing I love more than anything I have. The necklace was mother's, grandmother's. It will break father's heart. How could I'm you? I'm sorry. Oh, please, Leah. Please forgive me. Oh, poor Laurent. Nothing is important enough to have a come between us. Least of all, a quarrel over a gas. I'll make it up to you, Leah. I, I promise. Uh, meanwhile, I, I'll think of something to tell Father. We'll tell him the truth. Yes. Yes, I suppose we'll have to. To Mark, there was no city in the world like New Orleans. He wanted to see every foot of it. Especially the street they called Exchange Alley. I won't be long, Polly. An hour or two, I'll meet you here in the hotel. Well, what's all this excitement about Exchange Alley? I've dreamed about seeing it ever since I was knee-high. My father told me all about the schools there. The finest outside of Paris. He called it the Street of the Fencing Masters. Playing with swords, huh? Well, just remember this. New Orleans is filled with the same breed of cat as that Duro fellow with a necklace. Uppity young Creole. They want a duel every time you sneeze near them. My best behavior, Polly. No gambling, I promise. Be back here at 8 o'clock. Dinner at Antoine's, and I'll show you the town. Mark showed those young Creoles with their fancy French names that he was a match for any of them when it came to fencing. Among those he especially impressed was an elderly gentleman who kept staring at him. Forgive my lack of manners, young man, but before you leave, I, uh, I was hoping I might have a word with you. Oh, yes, sir? First, may I say it's been many years since I've seen such an exhibition of skill. May I ask whom you studied under? My father, Charles Fallon. Fallon, of course. I knew your face reminded me of someone. 
Why, Charles Fallon once taught in Paris. Yes, sir. Years ago. I told my friends I remembered that low inside line attack you employ. Why, I was at your father's academy many times. He's well, I hope. He died three months ago in New York. Oh, I'm sorry. My apologies. Please take my card, Mr. Fallon. I'd enjoy having you call at my house. Emil Duro. Is Laurent Duro your son? Yes, you know him. I met him and your daughter on the boat. Splendid. They'll be quite delighted as I am. I, I don't think they would want me to call, sir. Why not? I'm a river gambler. Oh, ridiculous. No one with your skill at foils could have spent much time at a gaming table. How long have you been on the river? Less than a week. <laughs> Shall we say tomorrow afternoon at four? If you wish, sir. Thank you. Well, Mr. Fallon, now that we've seen the house and grounds, suppose we have a drink in here in the study. Mr. Duro, your home. I've never seen anything so beautiful. My father built it almost 60 years ago. In those days, he... Angelique. Well, come in, dear, come in. Where's Laurent? He's in the library with George. George just invited us to dinner. Angelique, you remember Mr. Fallon. He said you'd met on the boat. I have no wish to meet him again, Father. Angelique. What do you expect of me? I know that gentlemen associate with such people as Mr. Fallon in coffee houses and gambling places. But I never heard of anyone bringing them into his home and presenting them to the women of the household. I choose very carefully whom I bring into my house. And while they're under this roof, you will please show them every courtesy. Yes, Father. Good afternoon, Mr. Fallon. Good afternoon, Mr. Rowe. I must apologize for my daughter. I think she was afraid of being embarrassed, sir. For what reason? This. She was afraid I might return it. A necklace. Your son lost it to me on the boat. I know it must mean a great deal to you. You settled a gambling debt with it. How much? Forty-one hundred dollars. My bank will credit the amount to you tomorrow. No, no, I, I don't want anything for it, and it is not your debt. It's the only way I can accept it. Your wine, Mr. Fallon. Thank you. All this, all this business about the necklace, Laurent, Angelique's insulting manners, it's my own fault, Mr. Fallon. My life's caught up with me. Unfortunately, my own wild and reckless youth's become somewhat legendary in New Orleans. My children have patterned themselves accordingly. They've been motherless since Leah's birth. I've never been able to be a stern disciplinarian. The first time I met your daughter, I, I told her that high-strung horses need a firm hand. I wasn't given a chance to say much more. <laughs> so another reason you came here today was to see her, huh? Yes. You find her interesting? Very. She can also be charming. However, I, uh, I, I should tell you, this young man she mentioned a moment ago, George Elwood... It uh, wouldn't surprise me, Mr. Fallon, if someday Angelique and George were to marry. Oh, I... Well, forgive me, I, I didn't know. Oh, for the moment, George is just a friend, but uh, a dear friend. But then I... I may see your daughter again? That, as you should know by now, will be entirely up to Angelique. Uh, however, there'll be a governor's ball in a couple of weeks. Uh, I, I think I can arrange an invitation. A river gambler at the governor's ball? I regard you as a welcome guest and a friend until you prove yourself something less. I think you can trust me, Mr. Duro. Thank you. Father? Come in, dear. George just told me you were driving with us to the ball. I'm so glad you are. Am I so charming a chaperone? Or, uh, or is it that you wish to keep George from proposing again? Both, my wise darling. He wants to announce our engagement. It's all he talks about since he became president of the bank. He's going to settle down. He promises to work hard. He loves me and on and on. It, um, it doesn't interest you? It isn't that, dear. I just keep telling him we're too young to take such a serious step. His father always hoped you two'd marry. And my father, what does he hope? That your choice will be a wise one when you're no longer too young. Leah, are you interested in Mark Fallon? Mark Fallon? How could you even think such a thing? His name seems to arouse more emotion than most. So there's a thorn when I step on it. You call him Mark. I've dined with him several times these last two weeks. He's becoming very popular. 
I don't want to hear about him. Why did you even mention him? Because I want you to wear something for me tonight. Your mother always wore it at the governor's ball. Here. Father. You will wear it. Yes. Oh, but I'm so ashamed. I couldn't tell you about the necklace. I knew how much it would hurt you. Lauren and I, we... We don't deserve you, the things we do. I don't know why. It just seems to be in our blood like a fever. Yes, in our blood, Leah. But you and Laurent are pale little pomegranates compared to what I was once. Now, dear, brush those tears away and make yourself ready. Very kind of you to dance with me, Miss Duro. It would have been a great pleasure to have refused you, Mr. Fallon. Then why didn't you? My necklace. It becomes you. So my father thinks. And so I'm dancing with you. But I'm amazed you could bring yourself to give it to my father. Weren't you able to sell it? Is that what you think? What else? Well, you're right. Your father paid me for it. And your escort seems impatient that we finish our dance. He seems a very suitable young man. He'll be delighted to hear that, I'm sure. Suitable, I mean, for running a bank. May I ask you one question before I leave you? Of course. Knowing how I feel about you... Why did you humiliate yourself by asking me to dance? Oh, as a matter of courtesy. If a man is going to ask a woman to humiliate herself, he should be willing to accept it first. I don't understand. Well, since you spare me only a moment, I'll tell you very bluntly. You and I are in love with each other. We always will be. We've known it since that first moment in St. Louis. I could have you run out of town for speaking to me like this. There's no need to run me out. I'll be leaving tomorrow. You're not ready yet for marriage. And I won't be ready until you come to me. Why, you completely egotistical. Yes, it does sound that way put into words. But it's the only way a woman can be truly happy with a man. Thank you for the dance, Miss Jewel. two of the Mississippi Gambler in a moment. With our American servicemen in many countries around the world, they have a wonderful opportunity to observe new customs and traditions. What might have seemed strange before is becoming pretty familiar to them. For instance, take this business of superstitions or omens. In Holland and Germany, if you meet a left-handed person on a Tuesday morning, that's a bad omen. In Sweden, if you turn around when starting out on a business trip, it's liable to turn out badly. German girls place their shoes at right angles by the side of their beds to bring a visit from their sweethearts. And in Japan and the Far East, there's a superstition to cover practically every event of the day. Well, all these things might sound strange, but as our servicemen have observed, we have plenty of superstitions, too. Let's just count some of the things that are lucky or unlucky. Finding a horseshoe? Lucky. Four-leaf clover? Lucky. A black cat crossing your path? Unlucky. Walking under a ladder, unlucky. Breaking a mirror, seven years bad luck. Spilling salt, unlucky. Unless you throw some over your left shoulder. Knocking on wood, lucky. A rabbit's foot, lucky. Well, those are just a few of them. Lots of people carry a lucky coin or a charm of some sort. All of us have a lucky number. And whenever we have something good happen to us, we know it's our lucky day. People the world over are great believers in this business of luck. That's all the superstitions are based on. They're either meant to bring on good luck or keep bad luck away. According to the customs and traditions of your own people, you do certain things to try to influence that luck. Now, the way of doing things may vary between different people, but the ideals are the same. These customs are important to the people who follow them, and our servicemen are helping to maintain goodwill by observing the customs of other people in other lands. Now, our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of The Mississippi Gambler, starring Tyrone Power as Mark and Linda Christian as Angelique, with Gavin Gordon as Monsieur Duroux. We left New Orleans, Mark and I, and went back to the riverboat. It was a fine, easy life, gambling all night, sleeping and lazing all day, and watching the sights along the riverbank. The weeks went by, and our bankroll grew fatter and fatter. Uh, What do you 
you thinking about, Polly? Counting all that cotton money we won last night? Well, I'm thinking about that cash you made me put in Elwood's bank in New Orleans. Hundreds of miles away and other fellas feeling it and fingering it. I'm not used to that. You know what we're going to do when we get enough, Polly? We're going to build a combination restaurant and gambling place. Better than any other in New Orleans. Rich, exclusive, with crystal and silver. Everything to lure the ladies and keep them happy while they gamble. Ladies gamble? Where'd you get that crazy idea? Well, where else can they go when their husbands gamble? Tea parties, sewing circles, sit home alone? They're bored, Polly. They want the same excitement their husbands enjoy, and we'll supply it for them. Not me. You try any crackpot ideas you want, but you're not going to get me off this river. Uh, you'll come running the minute I get those faro tables in. I like them better when they're on boats. <laughs> How long have you been on this river, Polly? Almost 30 years. Did you ever feel it was a lonely life? Mm, yes, when I was young, I'd find myself wishing all the pretty girls would take their boat traveling instead of hiding in those houses ashore. Many a night, I'd stand on the deck and look at them lighted windows over on the shore, and I'd... Well, I sure thought a lot about it. Just like you're doing right now. Yeah. It's no good. Come on, let's go down and start a game. Care to play a little poker, Mr. Fallon? Five honest cards. <laughs> yes, Mark, you got me weaned. But you know, sometimes I do get a terrible itch to take some of those suckers. Didn't you tell me that you've made more playing honest than you ever did by cheating? Uh, no, only cheating a little, it's more fun. We're not doing this for fun, Polly. We're going to build that place in New Orleans. Early in the game, a young man asked to sit in. I couldn't figure him out. Money in every pocket, but any fool could see he was neither a rich southern planter nor a man used to much money. Mark wanted him to quit, but he'd have none of it. He was cleaned up before midnight. Excused himself politely, went up on deck, and shot himself. How is he, Captain? Will he live? He's dead, Fallon. Oh. Apparently his aim was a lot better than his poker plane. You win all his money? Yes. Well, now, don't go blaming yourself. I heard how you tried to get him to quit. Is there anything I can do? Nothing. He has a sister aboard, but that's my job, telling her. I'd like to go with you, Captain. Yeah, all right, fellas, come along. Captain Everett, good evening. Well, come in. Uh, this is Mr. Fallon, miss. Uh, we come to... Well, I, I'm afraid we have bad news, ma'am. Your brother... Julian, what's wrong? He shot himself, miss. Where is he? It's no use, Miss Conan. But I've got to go to him. I wish I could say different, but there's nothing anyone can do. No. Oh, no, he wouldn't. He'd never do that. There's no reason. Could, could you tell us your parents or, or someone we could reach for you? We have no family, no one. I can't believe it. Julian would never... He was carrying money for his firm. Someone else did it to rob him. Miss Conan, I, I'm afraid your brother Your would... brother wasn't robbed, Miss Conan. Very wisely, he left his company's money with Captain Evers for safekeeping. Isn't that so, Captain? Oh, you, yes, yes, of course. We'll be landing tomorrow, Miss. I'd like to offer my help. Anything I can do now or, or in New Orleans. I'm very grateful. I don't know anyone there. I'll see you in the morning, Miss and Conant never knew that Mark returned to Brother's losses. But getting the money back to his firm in Ohio involved a visit to the bank in New Orleans, George Elwood's bank. George Elwood, who was in love with Angelique Durand. When Mark brought Ann Conant to the bank, Elwood had a visitor, Angelique's brother, Laurent. Sit down, Laurent. I'll be with you in a moment. Who's the girl with Fallon, George? A Miss Conant. Ann Conant. She's beautiful. Yes, she is. Well, present me to her. Well, this isn't a very good time, Laurent. She just lost her brother. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. But the fact remains, I, I've never seen anyone so beautiful. Please, George, I've got to meet her. All right, Laurent. But you'll have to wait. She's got to sign some papers first. You've been very kind, Miss Elwood. Thank you for your help. Well, that's quite all right, Miss Conant. And now, may I present my friend, Laurent Durand. How do you do? Miss Conant. Good morning, Mr. Fallon. Mr. Durand. You'll forgive Miss Conant. She should get back to the hotel. I understand, of course. 
my deepest sympathy. If there is anything I can do, please let me help. Mr. Elwood knows where I may be reached. Thank you. My regards to your father, Mr. Duro, and to Angelique. Thank you. They'll be delighted, I'm sure, to learn you're back in New Orleans. <laughs> Well, Polly, what news? I just saw the hotel manager. He promises to have a room for you, Miss Conant, within an hour. Oh, you've both been so wonderful to me. You don't know how much your help has meant. Oh, it wasn't help. We just like you. And Polly and I are taking the boat north in a couple of days, and, well, if, if you'd care to go back home at the same time... Well, I... I haven't any reason to go back to Springfield now. We only live there because of Julian's work. I'd rather live here. It, it's a beautiful city. Yes, I think you'd be happy here. There are a lot of attractive people you'd enjoy knowing. Then I'll stay. Good. We'll start looking for a place tomorrow. Will you be gone long? We'll be back at your doorstep in two weeks. You're a very beautiful girl, Anne. And from the first moment you're seen in public, you'll be so busy you won't be able to keep track of us. Oh, no, that will never happen. Come in. For Miss Conant, sir. Oh, just bring them here, please. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Camellias. Uh, yes, camellias. Oh, Mark. Uh, I, uh, I'm i sure there must be a card among... Them. Oh, how could you have guessed they're my favorite? Oh, this card. Laurent Dero. Oh, yes, the man at the bank. You've been seen in public already. Now let's order some lunch. And Conan stayed in New Orleans. In the weeks that followed, Mark and I spent most of our time on the river. But whenever the boat returned to New Orleans, we'd hear more and more rumors of Anne and Laurent de Rowe, and how madly in love he was. It means I want to marry you, Anne. I, I love you. I can't wait any longer to tell you. Oh, Laurent. But you can't be sure of what you're saying. You've known me for such a short time. It isn't fair. You've become you... my whole life since the moment I saw you. I... I've never been in love before. I, I never knew anything could be so perfect. And yet, such torture. I, I give you my life's devotion, Anne. Will you marry me? Today, now? I'm sorry, Laurent. You've been wonderful to me. No, but... no, no. You, you can't refuse me. Not yet. I, I didn't have any right to ask you so soon. I, I'll wait for your answer uh, till you've known me long. Oh, Laurent. It's better that I tell you now. Please don't go on hoping. I can never be in love with you. Because you're in love with someone else? Yes, I am. Mark Fallon? Yes. How can you waste your love on a man like that? How can you throw it in the gutter to someone who doesn't even deserve to look at Please. you? Cheating you, too. He's cheating everyone. Has he told you that he's in love with my sister... Sister. He's been in love with her ever since he came here. You think of loving anyone like that? Just go, Laurent. Please. Please go. That same night, Mark and I were back in New Orleans. We stopped off for a drink of the Rochambeau. At the bar was Laurent de Rome. I've been thinking of you, Fallon. You couldn't have come back at a better time. Do you mind if I ask you a question? Something troubling you, Duro? Yes. How many women do you want? You're not satisfied trying to get my sister, huh? Hold on, please. Come on, let's get out. You keep out of this, Andre. You're lying to Anne about me, trying to break us up. You want her for yourself in the flat you so thoughtfully got for You're her. a drunk, Duro. Go home with your friend and sober up till you can talk sense. Well, maybe that makes sense to you. I'll meet you at the dueling oaks. If you can leave your women long enough. Whenever you like. Our seconds will settle that. All right, Andre. I'm ready to go home. Oh, my fault, Mark. Please, please let me talk to Laurent. No, no. It has nothing to do with you, Anne. This has been building up for a long time. But you shouldn't have come here, you know. Polly, see that Anne gets home, will you? I must finish this. Finish what? There's no need of this. 
You'll win hands down. A will dividing everything between Miss Conard and me. Are you crazy? Then you do think something might happen. No. No, not really. Polly, you'll act as my second. Uh, just don't make too many side bets. Come in. I'm Andre Brion, Mr. Stover. I've come on behalf of Laurent de Rose. Oh, well, this is Miss Conant and Mr. Polly. Mr. Fallon, uh, I... Uh... You can speak freely. Thank you. If I may meet with your second, sir, to uh, arrange a meeting... Let's do without the formality, shall we? Let's say tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock. Very good. As the challenge party, you have the choice of weapons, sir. Pistols. Pistols? Oh, you are crazy. They'll fight with swords. Tell that to Duro. Swords. You'll forgive my friend, Mr. Brion. He worries too much. My choice is pistols. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Polly, you get Ann home all right? Now, come here. I want you to sign some... Angelique. I had to see you. You're going to kill Laurent. Perhaps he'll kill me. Did you come to ask me not to? No. Uh, are you as skilled with a pistol as you are with a sword? <laughs> Hardly. Perhaps you came to see me once more because I might not be alive tomorrow. I came only because I thought some member of the family should thank you for not taking advantage of him. You do me too much credit, Angelique. I take advantage only of women. <sighs> oh, surely you could spare me that kiss for being so noble. I despise you. Now listen to me. You didn't know there was less advantage in pistols, now did you? Not until I just told you. You came to see me, and I thank you most humbly. But when are you going to admit to yourself that you use your brother as a shield? That your devotion to him is because you're afraid of life and men? Because your mother died giving you birth? You have a driving hunger to live, but until you're willing to be honest with yourself... I hope he kills you. I hope he kills you. They faced each other the following morning at six o'clock. Mark and Laurent Duro. This was the way of gentlemen. I will count to three, Mason. On the word three, you will turn and fire. Are you ready? One. Two. Mr. Duro. Duro had fired on the count of two. Fired and missed. I regard your conduct as disgraceful as it was delivered. You may fire, Mr. Fallon. What are you doing here, Angelique? It's your brother I want to see. Laurent told me what happened. I have a right to hear. Yes, Father. Is there anything you want to tell me? I'm sure you know all about it by now. How I fired on the count of two and how that worthy gentleman preferred to fire into the air rather than... That's enough. You leave this house at your earliest convenience. Goodbye, Father. No. No, you can't ask such a thing. I have nothing more to say. You do that to him when he needs you the most? You can't. Father, if Laurent leaves... I leave with him. This house. Does it belong without you, Leah? Angelique left her father and with Laurent went to live with George Elwood and his mother. You've been writing letters all morning, dear. Now put down that pen and we'll go for a drive. I'll be soon in a moment, George. You see these letters? Hmm? Another month and you won't have any social life left. I've just turned down more invitations because you didn't invite Laurent. Good. Keep on doing it. <laughs> They're bores anyway. Just keep that chin high, Leah. Always high. I will, George. I love the way you walk through the public places with Laurent and me. Like a queen, ignoring the cuts they give him. You're wonderful. You and your mother have been wonderful, too. George, the wedding invitations came this morning from the engravers. Here, look. Oh? His Excellency, Governor Paul Monet, requests your presence at the marriage of Mademoiselle Angelique Duro. <laughs> I must send an acceptance. Are you sure she isn't marrying that Elwood fellow because she's getting used to him, living in his home? Because he's been devoted to her all his life. The dearest and the sweetest person she's ever known. And 
Is there love hiding around somewhere, too? You'll find it, George. You'll find it, darling. Stay away, Father, and have a servant bring you my wedding invitation. Thank you, darling. Here, yeah. you, you and George, uh, are you quite sure, dear? George and I grew up from childhood expecting to be married. Why, everyone in New Orleans has always said it's a perfect match. Yes, I know. That's all very true, but do you love him? Yes. That's all I wanted to know. <laughs> Yes, I... I received a wedding invitation this morning. Mark, you and I, we, we can talk bluntly. You love her, don't you? Yes. Yes, I love her. Then put a stop to this. Go and get her. Do you really believe that she knows herself well enough yet to find happiness in marriage to anyone? It was just a hope. You'll come to the wedding? No. I'll go back on the river where I belong. If there's... If there's any message you'd like me to give Angelique... Oh, don't, don't think me rude, Mr. Duro. But if I had any message, I'd deliver it in person. Once long ago, I told her I'd wait until she came to me. I'll continue to wait. The letters G-Y-A signified German youth activities. And wherever such an organization exists in Germany, you know that there, the way of democracy is being taught and encouraged. Our occupation forces are helping out through G-Y-A, developing healthy interests through group handicrafts and hobby projects. A girl by the name of Helga is one example. She was pretty confused when she joined a G-Y-A group. Her father had been very much anti-American and she reflected his ideas. Luckily, she won a trip to Switzerland in a handicraft contest. Once on the trip, Helga learned that the Swiss people and the American women in charge of the tour were very different than her father had pictured non-Germans. Well, she won't change overnight, but she wants to learn more about the workings of democracy, and her education is continuing through GYA. Such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. We pause now for station identification. Curtain rises on Act Three of The Mississippi Gambler, starring Tyrone Power as Mark and Linda Christian as Angelique, with Gavin Gordon as Monsieur Duro. <laughs> Angelique and George Elwood were married. We stayed on the river for almost a year, Mark and I, but on one of our visits back to New Orleans, Mark's dreams started to come to life. It was going to be the finest dining place and gambling salon in town. Well, I am your architect, Mr. Fallon. I think I can do whatever you want. Good, good. Now, I'll be on the river most of the time. You'll continue to get your instructions from Miss Conant here. She knows exactly what my wishes are. But, Mark, how can and I... I couldn't have gone this far without you. Please. I wish I had half your confidence. And you'll also have charge of decorations and furnishings. I trust that pleases you, Mr. Kennerly. It'll be a real pleasure, Miss Conant. I'll have a complete staff at your service. As for you, Polly, you still won't help me run it, huh? Not me. I'm investing in it. But you won't catch me wearing those droop flap tail coats like a cow whacking flies. I'll leave these revised plans with you, Mr. Fallon. Just sign them at your convenience. Ah, uh, yes. This'll do. We'll widen the archway. That'll give a clear view of the gaming table from the dining room. And we can... Mark. Well, don't you agree, Anne? You see, by widening the archway, we're... Mark. Hmm? I wish you were going to be here while the work's going on. So do I. 
But we're getting in pretty deep, Anne, and I haven't made enough yet to bank the tables against any big losses. May I ask one more question? Of course. Have you seen her? Angelique? No. No, I, I see her husband at the bank, of course, but we succeed very well in talking only about business. I shouldn't have asked. You've heard about her brother, that he left town. It's the best thing he could have done. One of these days, he's going to meet up with you, Mark. Please be careful. Oh, now, stop worrying. If you really want to help me, you'll invent a name for this place of ours. I already have. La Louisiane. La Louisiane. Perfect. We've got our name, Polly. La Louisiane. <laughs> You'd better hurry, dear. Our friends are downstairs waiting for us. I'll be ready in a moment, George. Well, how do I look? It's a beautiful gown, darling. But there's nothing, even from Paris, that could make you any lovelier. Why, thank you, dear. George, you're staring at me. Am I? Where are you, Leah? What do you mean, where am I? I'm here. Now, hand me my bracelet. You're not here, Leah. Not really. Every time I hold you in my arms, you, you seem a thousand miles away. It's like holding a shadow that's drifting somewhere. No substance, no warmth. Come here. Put your arms around me. Now, am I here? We're never here. We're never alone. Ever since our honeymoon, all was going, going. Crowds and people. I love you, Leah, but I can't reach you. What's wrong, dear? I don't know what you mean, George. I don't. When Laurent disappeared, I was frightened, but I'm not anymore. I do love you, and I've tried to make you happy and proud of me. Please tell me I haven't failed this much. I don't know why I say it. I don't know what it is. I, I want too much of you, darling. I can't stay away from you. I can't even... Yes, dear? Nothing. Nothing at all. <laughs> Come along, darling. I want to show you off in your new gown. <laughs> I suppose that sooner or later it was bound to happen. The linking together of Ann Conan's name with Mark's, especially now that she was seen so often at the building of La Louisiane. Well, gentlemen, Alan boasted about building a show place. It appears he's as good as his word. But who's that delightful creature talking to the architect? Don't be naive, Cartier. Alan's luck goes far beyond cards. Having a companion like that beauty. <laughs> That's a liar, Mr. Khan. I am not in the habit of lying, Mr. Durow. Miss Conant, you made it. Tell him to gentlemen and my friends. I must ask you to retract that plunder. I'll retract nothing. Oh, come now, Durow. Men don't rent flats for women or let them design gambling palaces unless they... You leave me no choice. I'll name my second this afternoon. A pleasure. We were on the river when the duel took place. Mark hurried back as fast as he could. He had something to tell, Mr. Duro, and his heart was never heavier. It's Mark Fallon, Father. You want to see him alone. No. I'll stay, Angelique. Stay. Mr. Duro, I'm grateful to you for defending Miss Conant, but you should have waited for me. I never ignored an insult to a lady, Mark. You must hurry and get well. You gave me your word you'd be at the opening of La Louisiane. No. No, I won't be there. No regrets. I've lived a long life. My era, it belonged to the sword. Fading with me. Perhaps for the best. There is something I must tell you, Mr. Duro. You and, and Angelique. Well? I've never faced a more bitter duty than... I meant to tell you. Laura, it's Laura. Yes. He came aboard at Memphis with a knife. I didn't recognize him at first. He was bearded. It all happened so quickly. I was unarmed. I, I tried to hold him off. We struggled. Laura went down. He fell down a staircase. He fell on his knife. No. Thank you for telling me, Ma. I shouldn't hold you responsible in any way. Now I... I want to ask one promise. Anything. Protect Angelique. 
Oh, I give you my word. Mr. Dura died a few hours later. Before he left the house, Mark asked George Elwood if he could see Angelique alone. There's very little you can say, and even less I want to hear. Angelique, once long ago I thought the odds were in our favor, yours and mine. But it seems to have been my lot to destroy everything you have loved. Perhaps you knew that from the start. I won't intrude again. Mark meant every word he said. But the time came many months later when he was obliged to call at the Elwood house once again. You're not welcome here, Mr. Fallon. You chose to do business with my bank, but that hardly gives you social privileges. It's business that brought me here, and it can't wait until morning. I've just come from the fencing academy. While I was there, three of your biggest accounts sought me out. Hewitt, Keith, and Farrow. They told me they're withdrawing their money tomorrow. Is your bank in shape to stand it? The bank is in perfect shape. They claim to have seen confidential reports to the contrary. If you're worried about your money, Mr. Fallon, I'll be pleased if you banked it elsewhere. I was told you've transferred Mrs. Elwood's estate into your bank. It's causing talk. That's ridiculous. Is it? Your father banked at the Southern Federal all his life. I transferred the account for one reason. Because I wished to. There'll be a lot of people at your bank in the morning, Elwood. You'd better be prepared to handle a run. If you have any more suggestions, you may see me there during business hours. I think you promised my wife never to intrude on her again. I also made a promise to her father. Good night. George, is there any danger? Certainly not. Then why did you ask me to change my account? Has the day arrived that you believe Fallon over me? George! Let me alone, Angelique. Just let me alone. Three days later, Elwood's bank went to the wall. George Elwood disappeared, and with him went $200,000. Mark and I, well, we were just two more depositors who'd been cleaned up. They warned me, Polly, but I, I just couldn't believe it. I'm sorry I dragged you down with me. I always told you that depositing money made me nervous. It means the end of La Louisiane, doesn't it? Mm. And after all your work, Anne. Oh, you'll finish it one day. We can start right now. You got a new deck of cards, Polly? You mean that? Why, I got a dozen new decks. And the boat for St. Louis leaves tonight at nine. <laughs> been keeping track of the sailings, huh? I've been missing those paddle wheels. So have I. Well, I better get those reservations. See you later, Anne. Anne, I... I hate leaving you here alone after... Well, after you being so much a part of all our plans. I'll always be grateful to you, Mark. But I haven't any claim on your life. I know that now. Even if this beautiful place had been finished, it never would have held you, so... If... If I can just see you and Polly once in a while... And, and know that... That everything is well with you, I... I... Oh, Anne. You're wonderful. Thank you. In the months that went by, Mark never lost track of Angelique. He knew there had been no word from her husband. He also knew when Angelique finally decided to sell her home. You'll sign the bill of sale here, Angelique. The Larry shares are in no hurry to take over. They said to move at your own convenience. Next week we'll be fine, Mr. Hewitt. I'm so happy to see you rid of this place, Angelique. To close this whole unhappy chapter of your life. You're going back to your own home? I don't know. I haven't been there since my father died. I think he would have wanted you to live there. Let me know what you decide. I will, Mr. Hewitt. Thank you. You aiming to stay over this trip, Mr. Fallon? New Orleans is a mighty gay town this time of year. I'll be leaving when the boat leaves, Captain. Well, tonight, 10 o'clock. You can count on me. Fine. Say, hey, ain't that Mr. Polly there on the dock? Yes, he, uh, he missed this trip. He had some business to attend to for me. See you tonight, Captain. Well, I've got good news for you, Mark. Better still, you can read about it for yourself. It's right here in the newspaper. Angelique, is everything all right, Polly? Yes, and this time I think you'll want to stop her. The court's handed down the decision. She's free. You know, you promised your father you'd always look out for her. Go to her, Mark. Try to see her. Now, it's... 
It wouldn't work out, Polly. It's better this way. Going back to her old home? She'll be there by now. No, I just told the captain I'll be leaving again on tonight's boat. Mm -hmm. I guess you know your own mind, Mark. After all, I never saw a man win all his best. Now let's get into town. I've got some winnings to split with you. I left Mark at the hotel, and I drove out alone to the old Duro mansion. I wanted to talk to Angelique, but I couldn't bring myself to go in. The house was dark, as it? But I knew she was there, her carriage was standing in front, and I saw a candle and the light moving from room to room, and I wondered how she could stand the loneliness and the memory. <laughs> I've come back, Father. I've come back, Norah. But it's so empty. So empty. When are you going to admit to yourself that you use your brother as a shield? Your devotion to him because you're afraid of life. Because your mother died giving you birth. You and I are in love with each other. We always will be. You're not ready for marriage yet. And I won't be until you come to me. Until you come. A moment later, I saw a rush from the house and a carriage with those high-strung horses dashing down the drive. Carriage, go set forward! Anybody going, Bert? Better hold her, Captain. Looks like you've got another passenger. There's a carriage coming down the wharf. Well, I'll be gone. Wait! Wait, wait, now, ain't that so, Mr. Fallon? Pull in your reins, lady. We'll wait. I've waited a long time to see a sight like this. Hey, where are you going? Angelique. I've come to you, Mark. Take me with you. Wherever you go. Wherever you go. <laughs> Now, here's Mr. Cummings with our stars. Mr. and Mrs. Tyrone Power, won't you please step forward and accept your curtain call? Now, won't you tell us about next week's play? Next week, we will bring you one of the fine, sensitive dramas of a famous playwright, Tennessee Williams, The Glass Menagerie, winner of the New York Dramatic Critics Circle Award. It was made into a beautiful motion picture by Warner Brothers. In her original role will be that brilliant actress, Jane Wyman, co-starring with those two outstanding artists, Faye Bainter and Frank Lovejoy. That will certainly be worth listening to. Good night. Good night. Good night, and hurry back. <laughs> Heard in our cast tonight were Ted DeCosh as Polly, Alistair Duncan as Laurent, Francis Robinson as Anne, John Stevenson as George, William Johnstone as the boat captain, Fred Mackay as Andre, and Bob Bruce, Bob Griffin, Herb Butterfield, Barney Phillips, Gain Whitman, and Eddie Marr. The Hollywood Radio Theater is produced by Mr. Irving Cummings. Our orchestra is under the direction of Rudy Schrager. This is Ken Carpenter inviting you to join us next week at this same time for another presentation of the Hollywood Radio Theater. Hollywood Radio Theater is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.